This is the City of Vancouver's brand new, a newest uh, Poet Laureate, Fiona. You can see Fiona on your screen there as well as in the slide that we've popped up. The Poet Laureate is the People's Poet and it's an honorary position with a flexible term of two to three years. During that term, the Laureate will act as a champion for poetry, language and the arts. Um, she will create unique literary projects and represent the city as laureate during readings at civic functions and public poetry events. The position is funded by a generous endowment that was established by Dr. Yosef Wask in 2006. To learn more about the Poet Laureate position, please visit uh, vpl.ca slash poet laureate. And once again, my colleague Greg will put that in the chat. Now, the author of three poetry books and a children's book, Fiona Tinway Lamb's work also appears in over 40 different anthologies, including Best Canadian Poetry. Uh, her work has won the New Quarterly's Nick Blatchford Prize and has been shortlisted for the City of Vancouver Book Award and has been thrice, that's three times, selected for BC's Poetry in Transit. She edited The Brightwell, a contemporary Canadian poems about facing cancer, and has co-edited the non-fiction anthology Double Lives with Kathy Stonehouse and Shannon Cohen and the non-fiction and poetry anthology Love Me True with Jane Silcott. Her award-winning poetry videos done in collaboration with filmmakers have screened at festivals both locally and internationally. A former lawyer, Fiona obtained an MFA in creative writing from UBC and presently teaches at SFU Continuing Studies. To learn more about Fiona, check out her website at Fiona uh, lamb.net, which also we've posted in the chat. Please welcome, join me in welcoming Vancouver's newest poet laureate, Fiona Tinway Lamb. Thanks so much, Jonna, and thanks too much, so much to the VPL team. You've done an incredible job putting this uh, reading together. So I want to welcome everyone in the audience today. We have a reading and a panel discussion to launch the Poet Laureate City Poems Contest that officially opens today. We're going to hear from Joanne Arnott, Junie DeZille, Evelyn, Evelyn Lau, Alex Leslie, and Kevin Spenst, who will read a couple of their place-based poems each and talk a bit about the pace, place their poems are, are relating to. And then we'll have a discussion with the group about how to approach writing place-based poems. This is in preparation for the contest that I've organized as Poet Laureate that aims to encourage youth, emerging poets, and established poets to write poems that relate to a place of historical, cultural, and or ecological significance within the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. The goal is to try to foster a greater understanding of the origins and the multifaceted history of what we now know as the city of Vancouver and the UBC endowment lands. I'll talk a little bit more about the contest later. Uh, and if there's time, we'll have uh, some questions and answers towards the end of our session. I wanna jump right in by introducing our first poet, Joanne Arnott. Um, you can see uh, the slide uh, about jo Joanne and her uh, bio on the screen. Um, she's an award-winning writer and editor and arts activist and a teacher. I've known her for many years and her warmth and her kindness and generosity have never uh, ceased to impress me. And she's um, got many legions of students who've been mentored by her. Um, I encourage you to look up her bio, look up her books, look up her website, and we're gonna hear two terrific poems from her this afternoon. Take it away, Joanne. Okay. With the cheese lift off. Well, thank you, uh, Fiona. Uh, I think this is a great project and I wish you uh, all good things in your uh, stint as Poet Laureate. Um, so I'll share two poems from one of my recent, uh, last books. It's called Halfling Spring, an Internet Romance. And the first is uh, set in this region. I live in Richmond. Uh, and I focused on the uh, Scotch Pond and the, the marsh around the edges of Steveston and Richmond uh, on that western side where the uh, Fraser and Ocean come together. Uh, so this is called Bird Companions. At the time of my writing, 
I was uh, very much engaged in sings the Aran Islands. So I quote that, but the birds mentioned and the landscape mentioned are not the same as what I'm delving into. As I lie here hour after hour, I seem to enter the wild pastimes of the cliff and to become a companion of the cormorants and crows. Fish. Heron stepping long-legged and slow along the shoreline, sharp observer, sharp-eyed observer of all that flows below the river's surface. A quick darting response, immersing your head to claim this fish life for your own. Then head aloft again, you strike a calm, calm and stately pose. Becoming airborne is always a challenge with those broad blue wings and fine walking limbs and graceful neck. To organize everything and launch skyward is difficult, yet daily you accomplish the task. You do fly with poise and strength and build a sturdy nest among the trees. Delta. River winds across land, gathering clay and soil and seed, building a delta that opens wide a lush expanse where red-winged blackbird stays to sing all year. The geese and duck arrive and they leave, arrive and they leave, return and then they leave again. Seasons follow seasons, year after year they make their path of wide world migrations. And they do stop by me, they do, to rest and feed, but only for a little while. Fish, struck by heron's bill and caught, lifted dripping from my home into the sky I go. Will I be swallowed? Will I slide all the way along the inside of that neck, come to rest, deep within, become one with the heron? Or will I topple to the side, fall from a high place, torn? Delta. A wide orchestral interplay of water and wildflower, mud and tough tall grass, the songs of the birds and the frogs liven our hearts. And the next poem that I thought to share is called Creation Story Akaluit. So this is, you know, from the uh, very lower, you know, southwestern corner of the land to uh, uh, one of the further furthest east and north cities. Uh, and here we go. Old bones in the backfield, scapula in dust, shards of pelvis, lifted, dusted, brushed, reassembled into a perfect pitched vessel. Lifting the old woman parts, dreaming the flesh into place and the big head babies passing through again, tongue probing broken teeth in a mouth warm with saliva, breath whistling through, whistle shaved from fibula, knuckles dance in my hand, remaking the self from the vitality of the field, from minerals and wind, from starlight, sunlight, moonshine, weaving the eons forward and back, molding the lichen and moss into rock piled mountains. The bony pleasure of a long hike around the bay and the deep cold water penetrating the flesh of each leg. Assembled well enough to carry a leather boot in each hand, walk barefoot with me through the long afternoon, through the tidal shifting day, through the sleep tossed night. Boots left by the door of the house, bones deeply embedded in the soft turns of your flesh, ribs lightly dancing the rhythms of sleep dreams unfurling on the inside, while dawn is slipping in, I have this night, this night, basking in the warmth of your sleep heat, stirring against you and curling toward you and breathing in the deep shelter of your arms. So that is my share. Beautiful, beautiful poems, Joanne. I love how you weave in place and time and timelessness into your work. Beautiful work, thanks so much. Our next poet is gonna be Junie Dezeel. 
Junie uh, is a terrific poet and her book um, was a finalist for the Dorothy Livesey Poetry Prize, the BC uh, Book Prize for Poetry. I was totally wowed by her poetry at an online reading two summers ago. And I'm so pleased that she can join us today to read uh, two poems that are set in um, the formerly known area as Hogan's Alley. Junie, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Fiona, and uh, thank you, um, to the staff at VPL for organizing this event and um, thrilled to be reading today. I'm going to read two um, short and sweet uh, pieces. Um, one is sort of situated in Hogan's Alley, which was the official name, or sorry, the unofficial name um, for Park Lane in uh, Vancouver's um, Strathcona neighborhood. The alley ran between Union and Prior Streets from approximately Main Street to Jackson Avenue. And Hogan's Alley was home to Vancouver's Black population. And so 50 years or so ago, the construction of the Georgia and Dunsmere viaducts um, displaced this uh, diverse immigrant uh, uh, neighborhood. I'm actually going to start with this poem called This Was Meant to Be for Nora, uh, Nora Hendricks, who is uh, Jimi Hendrix's um, grandmother. I dreamt Jimmy last night, tight purple pants frenetically keeping beat, sequin scarves and pink feather boa jamming and getting down to voodoo child, wah wah pedal squealing, a lullaby. I dreamt Jimmy last night fell asleep thinking about his grandmother, Nora, 827 East Georgia Street. I wanted my thoughts to permeate my dreams, have a conversation, inspire something, if not epic, at least sit at her knees, grandmother to granddaughter like, past history, future tense, talk community. But damn, that sexy intro to Vietnam War, machine gun, kept intruding in my dreamscape. I wanted to do more than a passing nod to fierce woman who co-founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church. 823 Jackson Street floats hazily in my dreams, all bright, neon -y, pinky purple to Jimmy's acid guitar riffs. Nora nods her head, claps, Bible in hand. What a trip. I dreamt Jimmy last night and this was meant to be for Nora. I am actually going to read um, uh, another piece called Pre-Pandemic Commute. I know we're so tired of this ongoing pandemonium. Um, this piece was written just at the beginning. <clears throat> Tune out the noise. Crowded, anxiety-inducing commute, weight of book too much. My tired hands, eyes defiant, read blurred text. I'm not ready for progressives. My eye doctor sells me on some revolutionary lenses designed with a subtle power shift. Should ease the strain from reading screens. Proving prescient now, Zoom is a verb. Virtual cocktails the norm colleagues, kids, and racist Zoom bomb meetings. Screen fatigue is real and capitalism sure knows how to capitalize. I miss the pleasantries with the one who knew my name, the one who would be an extra, the one who would remind me to visit home one day, the one who remembered a kindness I forgot as she clasped and held my hands on her way to her graveyard shift. Even the trains and buses filled with conversations at times unwelcomed. Compliments on my red framed glasses. Thank you. Lovely, Junie. And I loved your red frame glasses. Every time I see them, I love them. <laughs> They're terrific. Thank you for sharing those poems. Next up. We have Evelyn Lau, who almost needs no introduction. Um, she's the third Vancouver Poet Laureate. I've been a fan of hers since uh, her first book was published, um, Runaway Diary of a Street Kid. And I, of course, I knew about her too um, from a personal level, which I won't go into here. 
but uh, she is an amazing poet and she writes about place with a lyricism that can't be beat. Um, please, and I'm so honored that she could read with us today. I teach with her at SFU Continuing Studies and um, she's a longtime friend. Thank you for coming, Evelyn, and please take it away. Thank you, Fiona. Um, technology is really not my thing. We are so lucky, Fiona, to have you as our as our current poet laureate. We are the luckiest. And I'm proud to call you a friend as well as a colleague. Um, I'm going to read two poems today, both of which are a bit prosaic. So I'm actually not entirely happy with them, but that's that's true of probably um, most, most published poets. Um, the first one is called City Center. I've lived in downtown Vancouver now for 26 years in the same teeny little apartment. Um, and I wrote this poem at the 15 year mark of, of living downtown um, when there were already so many changes. And of course the changes have kept piling on. Um, it's just a cascade of high rises now. But believe it or not, when I first moved in, I could walk down the street and actually see houses downtown. Um, so this poem kind of memorializes that fact. Um, it takes uh, many of its details from not just my walking around the neighborhood, but from an article in the Vancouver Sun um, about a woman who was forced to move um, from one of those houses, a longtime owner. Um, so many of these details are rooted in, um, in fact. So city center. In this neighborhood, I've lived through 15 years of construction and destruction on a downtown street choked with the debris of progress, clouds of dust barreling down the road like Mack trucks clogging my throat like fur. I squint my eyes against the peppery sting of it, the painful watering, pray my way across the blind intersection, the soles of expired buildings like soft gray shrouds smothering the air. How soon we forget what used to be there. The eccentrics clapboard house with its yard of painted birdhouses, now a glossy condo. After 40 years of rising property taxes, he finally moved, died a month later. His neighbor across the street stuck it out a decade longer in a cottage next door to a nightclub, weak roses straggling the barbed wire fence, her taxes so steep she cancelled cable and newspaper, couldn't afford the luxury of a new lipstick or quilt for winter. Dwarfed by the forest of high rises, she would patrol the street in front of her house, head wrapped in a kerchief, black dog slinking at her feet. Months after she moved, someone left a card sealed in plastic, decorated with limp streamers, tacked to the developer's fence around her house with its drooping sashes and shattered attic window. Happy birthday, little greenhouse. I should also say that um, I was lucky because that poem was made into a very charming and moving video poem um, by Jen Strom for Knowledge Network. So I think if you go to the Knowledge Network website, you can see her creation, which really adds a great deal to the experience of the poem. Um, my other poem is called The Chinese Museum. Um, I've been estranged from my family since my teens, but there is one aunt that I see a couple of times a year, and this poem came from our um, meeting up at the Chinese Cultural Center Museum in Chinatown. Um, and what I reference here, um, the first line of the poem is Grace committed suicide again. Grace um, was one of my other aunts um, who is schizophrenic, was schizophrenic, and made multiple suicide attempts before she finally succeeded. This is called the Chinese Museum. Grace committed suicide again, you say, in your second language, rather than attempted, as if my aunt were doomed to an endless cycle of reincarnated lives to end. 
We're walking in the Chinese Museum down a corridor of black and white photographs. Six immigrant bachelors sharing one housekeeping room, crammed like mackerel in the hold of a ship. We're admiring the artifacts, abacuses strung with jet stones, cotton robes with cloud-shaped collars, the opium bed whose lacquered, rose-carved sides could hold a man safe inside his dream all day, like an infant in a barred crib. How small our ancestors were last century, the merchant families posing for photos in their stiff, gilded clothes, the men who left wives and babies behind to work on the rails and in the mines, the ones who hung themselves in their single rooms to escape gambling debts, drug addiction, to escape their lives. Grace, auntie number 12, was fished out of the sea into which she leapt days after she'd gone missing again. The seams of her clothes were seeded with sand, so you knew where she'd been at the beach, watching the waves for days. We hug goodbye, I hurry through Chinatown, past shivering clerks in souvenir stores, surviving beneath brass Buddhas and bamboo fans, paper lanterns and polyester kimonos. Home is a one bedroom above an alley. After 20 years of living here, it took a friend to point out that the view from my window Moss-covered rocks on a rooftop wasn't just moss and rocks, but a rock garden. Thank you. Beautiful poems, Evelyn. And they're from um, um, Tumor, her book Tumor, and also um, A Grain of Rice, which I recommend. I recommend all of uh, Evelyn's beautiful, beautiful books. And in, in, in the Chinese museum poem, there's this wonderful incorporation of, of history um, and all the senses and of course a present story about the aunt. It's just this wonderful uh, seamless weaving. And same with the story in um, the, the Little Green House poem, um, the city center poem, there's the, you know, information from the news article about the woman um, who, who left her little green house. And it's, it's so moving um, to read about her and how much she loved her house and how she remained one of the few people who, who stayed um, behind after all this demolition, which of course continues. Seems that the city's always undergoing demolition and renovation and renoviction uh, and so much more. And that seems to have been the case since before the city was even a city. Uh, with all the uh, First Nations villages that we now uh, occupy and the villages and communities that were in Stanley Park. So this is a, a great poem to give us a taste of talking about what doesn't exist anymore. Our next poet is going to be Leslie, Alex Leslie. Alex, I had the pleasure of meeting at the City of Vancouver Book Awards last November when um, their second book of poetry, Vancouver for, for Beginners, was shortlisted for the City of Vancouver Book Prize. It also won the Western Canada Jewish Book Prize for Poetry. Um, she's a wonderful writer in both poetry and prose. And what's so cool about her, their, their prose poems, is that there's this, um, this collaging, it's kind of almost hallucinatory and fantastical. Um, when I first heard their work, I thought of Italo Calvino's um, work as well uh, in that genre. So I think you're, you're in for a treat. So here's Alex Leslie. Hi everyone. Um, I'd like to repeat the thanks uh, voiced by the readers for Fiona um, inviting me to read today and um, also to the VPL for hosting. I'm going to read a couple poems from my book, Vancouver for Beginners, um, which is available from Book Hug Press online. The first poem I'll read is called Rainforest Paradise. Now that there is no weather, there are only trends. Roots knit an urban basket. 
This was all forest way back when. Old growth towers, glass swan spines. Public parks and buckets lined the curbs for pickup. Recycling Mecca, whose residents eat compost with full cream and push the poor from rooftop gardens into moss that flows from the lips of dumpsters. Ocean dreaming in the background, mountain, mountains offering shadows to lean into. A sh sheltered city pillaged for bed frames. The forest's understory inhales. Creeks shout from the manholes. On public transit, a wave sounds meditation CD has been playing on loop for 180 years. Born into this misty static, residents swing axes at each other's ankles and fall like saplings into Taiwan bound barges and post industrial wet dreams, into hammocks knit from track marked cedar branches. Hydroponic lovers nest in shore phone booths. A bulldozer uncurls its sleepy head and splits the street open with an egg tooth. At night, raccoons patrol the streets, the valleys and alleyways with the cops, obligatory ravens wing to wing down the wires, and a man pushes a shopping cart full of huckleberry plants, salal, and prehistoric ferns towards the bottle depot. On his off nights, he is a flamethrower. And I'm going to read one more poem. It's called um, Land Registry. And I wrote this poem as um, the kind of land acknowledgement in this book. Um, I'm a settler. My heritage is English, Irish, and Ashkenazi Jewish from Eastern Europe. And my family has been here for, on one side of my family, um, my parent was actually born elsewhere. On the other side of my family, my parent was born here. And so I really wrestled writing this book, which is a book about my hometown, Vancouver, with also um, questions around like entitlement to write a book like this, um, my own identity, wanting to um, kind of spoof a guidebook with like kind of the um, like Fiona said, hallucinatory aspects of the city. So this is my poem called Land Registry. And it's about um, an app called the Land App. Every new arrival gets a free upload. The Land App is your personal guide to here. Streets encrypted, creases in palms and depth charts, satellite mapped. Your first road lies between index finger and thumb. Uploads directly from the particle of dirt you place on the touch screen. Which memory would you like to resume? Your open hand intertidal zones between forefinger and middle peninsula. The land app comes with three settings, geologic time, provincial park, and the begin of forget. While the land app scans your sample, the tectonic anthem drifts in your earbuds. Use with caution or the city will peel at its edges. You grew up here, people say, nobody stays here. Swipe right for catacomb, place the earth on the center of the screen. Do not touch while the scan is completed. Do not refresh while the scan is in process. You can be an urban explorer on your lunch break. The land app color matches your sample to the tastes and lifestyle preferences of those in your region. Windshield you wept through as a child, seeing scarscape on a mountain's exposed collarbone. I know this place like the back of my hand. Never much went anywhere else. Addiction is mineral. Press your finger to the screen. Take it, take everything you want. Finger whorl stamped in concrete. When blood alley, your results are in. Negative. 
you were never here, an uninvited visitor who never left. Oh, thank you so much for listening. Fantastic. Alex Leslie, everybody, with that terrific, terrific book um, that uh, I hope everyone, yes, everyone will look up. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Um, there's such there's a, a real surrealism running through the poems and and they're so vivid I almost see them as as, uh, as a painting actually a moving painting um, beautiful beautiful work our final poet of our five is last but not least Kevin is uh, the author of several poetry collections and chapbooks. Um, and he occasionally co-hosts uh, Wax Poetic on Vancouver Co-op Radio. Um, you can see from his bio that uh, he's quite a prolific author. He's also an exuberant and dynamic presenter and reader and teacher who teaches at uh, SFU Continuing Studies. And I've had the pleasure of uh, reading alongside him and being my jaw dropping with uh, amazement. Anyways, Kevin, please take it away. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much, uh, VPL, for um, hosting this. I'm going to jump into my first poem. It's called Stanley Park, 1869, semicolon, a fairy creek stump of a, of a year in review, 2021. I wrote it for um, today. It begins with an epigraph by Phyllis Webb. No, I don't want your hugs, I'm sorry, or the chainsaw gangs or tongues of flame, the tree speaks. Two lumberjacks hack into the root swell of a Douglas fir. Into the notches they insert springboards upon which they hack even higher notches. From the third set, the lumberjacks balance above the forest floor, roll up their sleeves and get into it. They are settlers, but they're young, migratory. They will move on to other cities before settling down. The sun never sets on their world, which is wherever they please to roam. They arrived for the gold rush near this neck of the woods and stayed for whatever work they could pick up. Against the 600 years of the tree, they work rhythmically, wordlessly. They live in a camp nearby of men and little is said. At dinner, silence is mandatory but alcohol in a nearby town coaxes them out of themselves into tall tales about the fog being so thick one year, the lookout boy steps out from the crow's nest and walks on top of the fog for a mile to reach this savage land. Tall tales are the dumbed down sitcoms of the era broadcast during the prime time drinking hours of darkness. The lumberjacks rarely work hungover, almost always unquestioningly. Now it's time to apply the cross cut saw. They heave and hoe at the first cut for the wedge that determines the fall of the tree. They are the unwitting forces against nature for a system monetizing time and land. They see themselves as the civilizing waves washing over the world as if they were its baptism, or that's what the preacher tells them in the shanty church set up one Sunday for their souls. The 600 year old tree will fall and be turned into lumber to be sent elsewhere to make masts and spars for a navy that has taken the world hostage within a net of abstractions. Nothing but the notches will remain in the forest that will become a park and generations later, the notches will look like so many mouths frozen open in a cry. One upturned base of a tree seems to have fallen by a storm and only afterwards was sawed up for lumber. If that tree had fallen with no one around, would it have made a sound? I'm telling you this as a dumb and offensive question, for are forests not always full of birds, bears, and other creatures? What does it profit a man to abstract all these listeners away as if a forest were nothing but cold, hard timber? Yet this train of thought continues to this day. Two lumberjacks hack into the root swell of the Douglas fir. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty fresh poem. And in fact, I changed the title um, minutes before we started to include Fairy Creek. Um, this is what you can do when a poem has not yet, um, when a poem isn't published, let's say. Um, my second poem is something I wrote uh, last year around this time. 
And last year, around this time, I was spending a lot of time in Stanley Park. Like a lot of people, um, we were in the park seeking kind of solace um, from everything happening around us. The previous year, I'd launched a book of poetry and I'd launched that book of poetry with a series of outdoor readings because of course we couldn't do things um, indoors. And the last um, location for my reading was um, the image that you just saw, that slide that was up. Um, there were the rocks and the, the twigs, uh, an area or yeah, rocks and logs. Um, I'd created an area in the middle of the forest as a kind of stage for a book launch. And um, I launched the book there and then, um, and then my life changed. And I, when I went back to that um, spot, a long time later, somebody was actually reworking it. This poem kind of is about that. Out too late in the wind drift. A sentence is easily composed. It's like this path of rocks that may or may not lead to safety. How do I even know you're reading these rocks I stumbled across in the forest? Though I don't not know that you were the one who rearranged them when I was crying in my room for several months. A long time ago, she and I built a ceremony on a stage of sticks and moss with a pile of rocks in the middle of nowhere. You'd be lost to find it. One day, the chronology of she and I broke down, and someone used the rocks to build a path that leads out of the stage. Between two trees gapes a door. Someone is reading the sign warning what to do in case of a coyote encounter. Make yourself big and shout. I've once again wandered off. Tears stretch the sun to a plastered point. And I think, oh, a cute dog. Someone is nearby. Then I realize it's time to shout, which feels like something I've been training for. After it prances off, I line up the winds to make them say something true to the blood bolting through the forest of my body. Alone is an illusion and unknown loved ones reside inside our voice, only there to help. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Kevin, for those poems. Uh, there's the history of, of Stanley Park and actually of the city and of any of our towns of, uh, that used to be forest. And then, of course, um, we've got the coyotes of Stanley Park, who have been in the news for uh, a while, for quite a while over the course of, of the pandemic. Anyways, uh, wonderful, wonderful poems by our five poets. Thanks so much, uh, Joanne, Junie, Evelyn, Alex, and Kevin. I'd like to bring you um, all back uh, onto the screen so we can talk a little bit about writing site-based poems. So with this contest, there's some people, of course, who've been writing poems for a long time. Uh, some people have not written a poem for a long time or written a poem ever. And I'm wondering if you all could talk about how you write place-based poems. What is the door, the window, the little crack, the crevice, the, the mouse hole? But that allows you to enter a poem to start writing it. Um, do you have any advice or thoughts about that? Um, Kevin, do you want to say a few words? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I was thinking, um, I mean, the obvious advice with place-based poems is go to that place. But let's <laughs> say um, maybe what's maybe not obvious is you should go to the place and return to the place and return and go to that place and observe the changes of the place and observe the changes in yourself and you know leave something behind and really you know participate as much as you can in that place in whatever capacity you can even if it's a, you know in, in whatever imaginary ways um, that are possible um yeah and so for me it's um stanley park going into stanley park and um and observing and observing again, and also doing little things to, to, to note the changes. Oh, cool. How about uh, you, Alex? Do you have any advice or thoughts about how to enter into a place-based poem? Um, so like Kevin, I did go to a lot of the places in, 
in the book um because it's a book that's um in part autobiographical like there's parts about being a child in Vancouver and I would actually like I actually went to like my old elementary school and walked around it was very strange and it was interesting because like I wrote so intensely from memory um and because I still live um here I was able to like go back to the actual places and they were completely different than my memory so the book was kind of a strange return to some of these spaces from childhood and I think that there's also um for me something about um taking notes like going to the place and like taking notes and then also sometimes that those notes turning into the poem mm -hmm. like being the skeleton of the poem I tend to write many drafts of things, but the notebook um, part of things is really important for me. Like I would encourage someone if they're stuck to like go to a place with a notebook and just write stream of consciousness, what you observe, what you remember, what you feel, and then see where that takes you and just be curious. That's great advice. Thank mm -hmm. you, Alex. And Evelyn. You've done a lot of mentoring and teaching. What would you suggest and how did you approach your place-based poems? Oh, I agree, of course, both with Kevin and Alex and, you know, in terms of revisiting a place um, and being attentive, you know, paying attention to um, all the details of that place and immersing yourself in it. Um, I find juxtapositions really interesting. So the juxtaposition of a physical space with um, some something you are wrestling with in some way it doesn't have to be a personal trauma but it could be you know story from the news or something that is you know perplexing you um, or preoccupying you and somehow grafting that onto a physical space you know and the relationship between where you're at and where your head is at can create you know an interesting tension um so I enjoy sort of playing with that. Um, and if you are stuck, when you're in that place, um, you know, go through your senses, you know, try to find um, not just, we all tend to be fairly visual people, but maybe there is, you know, a sound that, um, or a lack of sound, you know, in a place that makes it intriguing or, you know, the, the texture of something there or a scent. Um, you know, make sure you have something from all your senses that you may, um, these things may not end up staying in the final poem, um, but they create a kind of richer tapestry in the poem that you can build upon. Great, great comments, Evelyn. It's so true. Um, when I teach, I often talk about using all the senses and often smells are a very strong one that we forget about. Um, and uh, also the sounds, that little bit of dialogue that you hear someone in conversation saying, you know, one little phrase, and that could be a slide you right into the poem um, or something from newspaper clipping um, or the tastes, you know, the residual taste. Say it was at the a poem about the PNE, all the tastes there, right? Um, and uh, of course, there are also lots of books with history and so forth. You could do an ekphrastic poem based on a photograph, a historic photograph or a set of photographs. That could be another way of entering through the sentence, uh, the senses, imagining uh, the sensory inputs you would have had if you had been there, what you would have heard and what if you, you would have tasted or smelled or experienced. That's great. And Junie, do you have, any additional comments about writing place-based poems or how you approached yours? Yeah, I mean, everyone ahead of me said said all the good things too. Um, <laughs> Darn so it. that also true, yeah. <laughs> um, but I tend to also enter place poems um, writing about people in, in those places. Um, you also mentioned something about senses and I find that I rely a lot on my senses. So I haven't read anything uh, recently in public, but um, I did grow up in Treaty, Treaty One territory in Winnipeg. Um, and that sound of like, you know, just after fresh snowfall, that I call it snow sound or no sound. Mm. Um, it always, you know, brings this sense and I love writing um, 
through that sense or through sound. Um, sometimes I like sitting in favorite places. Um, the Key in New West um, is a good place that I used to love sitting in to write um, the Sky Train to enter into places. I find that for myself, I, um, I feel that, you know, the three cities I've lived in, I feel quite transitory. Um, so I'm always writing as move while moving. So writing on public transit is a way to write into spaces. So I try to use everything. I don't really limit uh, myself and um, I might, you know, glom onto something and then that's my little obsession. And then I start writing about that place. So yeah. That's, that's right, me. anything, anywhere, any little thread, right? And I like the idea of, of the sky train or transit, walking, cycling, whatever it is, because that's physical movement, but it's also emotional and uh, mental movement into a space. And even as you describe moving into the space, you are moving into the poem. Somehow it works. Um, and I loved how you used the dream, right? The dreams are terrific. And the, the surreality of it and the rhythms of it, um, the way they, they make leaps everywhere uh, is fascinating and, and um, can make for a terrific uh, poem as, as you wrote. Thanks, Junie. And Joanne, I know you've, everyone's already said all this stuff, but Joanne, do you have something to add about writing place-based poems? Yes, I do. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, how, would I, how would I state it? I think uh, you know, one thing I encourage writers to do is to do a kind of a uh, inspection of your inner geography, right? So for myself, I was born in Winnipeg, Treaty One territory, like Judy, and uh, lived in East Vancouver, uh, rural Manitoba, and Windsor, Ontario, which is a factory town. So those were very different landscapes. And after I had returned to the coast and was writing poetry for, you know, decades, I, it suddenly occurred to me that my inner landscape continued to be the Manitoba one that, uh, you know, the deep, dry heat of summer, the you know severe cold, the beauty of the changing seasons, which is spectacular, uh, and and so I had to make a, a so I did a kind of a you know autobiography of my geographies, and then uh, begin to honor the place that I had chosen to make my home, right? To uh, to notice more the actual place I am in. And I think, you know, one of the virtues for that is that, you know, if I go to a place with that inner fascination with my birthplace, uh, I don't see it in the same way that I would if I had kind of made peace and said, okay, I'm not looking there right now, I'm looking here. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that is my advice. <laughs> yes, that's good advice from a, a, a great teacher. We've got lots of uh, very good poets uh, in our audience too. And please put, feel free to put something in the chat if you have some advice uh, to share or suggestions to share about writing uh, place-based poems. Um, um, as Brian Brett mentioned, it could be the, uh, the print that's in your, in, on your walls um, you could write about. And, um, and it's, yes, that juxtaposition between the memory of a place that Alex talked about and the actual present reality of the place, that is a that gap between those two um, experiences is definitely a rich place to, to explore. So, um, Jonna, did you wanna see if anyone has questions for our panel? Hello again. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody. Those were such amazing poems. We did have a um, question in the Q&A um, that I would like to draw to everyone's attention. This is from Ella M. And she says, what is your process when learning a poem slash practicing reading it? So if you all want to speak to that, I think we've got enough time to do so. Who would like to talk uh, to that question? Sorry, could you repeat that? I, I didn't quite understand. Absolutely. Uh, Ella says, what is your process when learning a poem slash practicing reading it? 
I see that Kevin uh, has typed in an answer into the chat, as well as Junie. I won't read for you, but perhaps uh, Kevin and Junie could read, and then uh, Evelyn, you might make better sense of the question. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Um, sure. I, I don't know where my answer went. I clicked send and now it's gone. So here's what I remember. I, I mean, I, I will compose my poem um, out loud often, or as I edit a poem, I will read it aloud or hear it in my inner ear. And then once it's done, it's sort of done. And then when I read it, I, I like to think of that stage as something different. And I like to give the poem another life because it's being performed for other people. And so that context is somewhat different than the silent poem that's there on the page for someone to enjoy on their own. Um, so I try to have fun and I try to make use of that, um, you know, that little extra heartbeat that I have um, reading in front of other people. Yes, and Brian has some good advice about reading uh, your poems over and over and over and over again aloud, read them out in different places, record yourself, and listen to yourself if you can handle it. <laughs> listen to yourself and you'll realize, oh my goodness, maybe I can cut here or I need a pause there, or I need maybe another image over here. So there's all kinds of different ways, but definitely practice, practice, practice is a very important uh, tool. Junie, did you have any comments about learning and, and practicing and, and reading poems aloud? It was similar to Kevin's with the addition that I also record myself on my iPhone or my voice memo just to hear what it sounds like. And that's where I focus on where am I stumbling, where doesn't, you know, sometimes things make sense on the paper and then you read it out loud and you're like, oh, no, that didn't work so well. Uh, <laughs> so that's usually how I do it. But I, I don't actually like to practice too much. I personally, I, it could be wrong, but I personally feel that I have a bit of a monotonous voice. So the more I practice, the more it's, I sound flat. So, or that's what mm -hmm. I believe. <laughs> so I don't read uh, as much, but I do try to listen to where, where I'm not feeling natural or the, the pauses don't work so well. Great. The idea of learning a poem as opposed to writing a poem is an interesting one because um, when I'm intrigued by somebody else's poem, the way that I learn it is not only by rereading and reading out loud, um, but by actually handwriting the poem out. Um, oh. It's a laborious process, but um, in doing so, I, I feel I can fully enter what the poet might have been thinking um, and why they were making certain decisions about line breaks and punctuation and so forth. So that, that effort of writing it out um, helps me learn a poem. And it's interesting um, what Junie said about, the, um, about reading. Um, I think many of us do read many drafts of our work out loud in order to hear you know the, the clunky phrases and the things that don't work but there is that element of still wanting to surprise ourselves with our own work and not wanting to read it to the point where it's so polished that you know the words just kind of like skitter off of you right you know you still want to embody it when you're reading it for an audience so I do understand that element of wanting to kind of you know preserve the reading out loud of one's own work um, in order to actually you know, experience it and inhabit it fully um, for an audience and not just for our own editorial purposes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Great advice. Well, we're close to the end of the hour and I wanted to make sure that I talked about the City Palms contest and I've prepared some slides here um, to tell you a little bit more about it and encourage everyone to not only submit, but tell others to submit. Um, there's so many possibilities of places to write about historical, cultural, and ecological places. And I pulled up this old map here of um, 1898. Of course, the place we live in is much older than this, but you can see uh, with the development and the grids of the city and all the tall ships, steamships coming in, um, what it looked like back then. So, um, and the next slide, uh, tells you about 
who's eligible to enter the contest. You don't have to be uh, living within Vancouver. Uh, you could be from anywhere. You can be a youth, grade 12 or under, an emerging poet who has not published a book yet of poetry or an established poet who's already published a book or more of poetry. Next slide. There are awards for each category. There's a first prize of 300, a second to 200, third prize of 100 for each category. Um, there'll be uh, winners will be notified and announced in June. And it'll be published in the Writers Fest newsletter as well, which goes out to 14,000 readers. It's a lot of readers. Next slide. So submitting your poem, how do you do it? Well, today, officially, you can submit uh, starting today until April 15th, but you can only submit two poems maximum and you can't replace or substitute your poem. So only submit the two poems that you think are ready uh, for submission. You can go to this website um, on the VPL. There's a gray bar for the City Poems Contest. If you click on it, it opens up to the submission rules. And you can also go to my own website, which has a city poems contest page and the submission form and everything you need to know. Submission is free. And the next uh, slide, we've got terrific judges uh, for the youth category, Dr. Bonnie Nish, who is the executive director of the Word Festival. For the emerging poets category, we have David Lee, who is a, an accomplished poet and also an editor of um, poetry for this magazine. And of course, a fabulous poet, a poet laureate of Vancouver in the past, Rachel Rose, multiple prizes um, uh, for her terrific uh, poems. And she's also a prose writer and a mentor. Um, and I can't say enough about her uh, work and her, her judgment. So these three uh, terrific poets have agreed to be judges for our contest. Um, and if you have any questions about the contest, you can email me. My email is um, uh, Vancouver Poet Laureate number six at gmail.com. And I'll type that into the chat in a second. Um, and you can also go to my website, fionalam.net, which will have uh, contact information there. So I'm hoping that you'll all consider submitting a poem to the contest and letting your friends and family and classmates and whomever your neighbors know about it so they can contribute too. So thank you to the five terrific poets we've heard today. Uh, you were really wonderful and you chose the perfect poems, Joanne Arnott, Junie DeZille, Evelyn Lau, Alex Leslie, and Kevin Spence. Thank you to everyone in the audience who is out there listening and watching and loving poetry. Thank you for your support. I hope each and every one of you will uh, have a great weekend and a great week ahead and will consider submitting to the contest.